Equal Opportunity Commission to undertake an independent review into the existence or prevalence of sexual discrimination, harassment and predatory behaviour within the South Australia Police. I requested this because of work that I'd been seeing done in other jurisdictions and I saw there was a need for us to check the health of our own organisation in terms of the culture we provide people who work for the South Australia Police. That review has been completed and today is the day we are formally releasing that review. Sadly, what this review tells us is there is an unacceptable level of sexual harassment, discrimination and predatory behaviour within the South Australia Police. And this means we have to do some work to change our culture. There are incidences ranging from uh, inappropriate joke telling through to the more serious um, sexual assaults that will require us to examine how we look after our people and the environment we're providing those people to come to work. Every person regardless of who they work for, has the right to be treated with respect and dignity at work and to be safe at work. My obligation going forward is to ensure that we change the culture of the organisation so we provide a workplace that delivers on those non-negotiables. In order to achieve that, I have accepted all 38 of the recommendations contained within the EOC report and I would like to thank the Equal Opportunity Commissioner, Dr Nikki Vincent, and her team for the work that has gone into producing this report that gives us the foundation upon which we can make the changes that must be made. I am also taking offline one of my Assistant Commissioners, Assistant Commissioner Brian Fay, who will head up a team to drive the implementation of these recommendations and work vigorously to change our culture so it is the sort of culture that we would all like it to be. We're creating a safe space program which will enable people who want to come forward and provide information the capacity to do so with full confidence that they'll be treated with respect and listened to and taken seriously. They'll also have the uh, knowledge that those uh, allegations and information they provide will be taken with the utmost seriousness and dealt with in the same manner. We're also going to introduce immediately a restorative engagement program where people can simply come and tell their stories to a senior member of the organisation, knowing that they'll be believed and to receive an apology where that is necessary and appropriate. I do need to point out that the culture of the South Australia Police is a good culture. What we have identified are elements that must change. We, we are committed to this going forward and these recommendations will enable us to do that. The report does not define everybody in SAPOL, but what it does do is provide us a framework that enables us to show leadership to accept the past and to move forward, ensuring that we provide that workplace that I believe everybody is entitled to. Thank you. I'd now like to hand over to Dr Nikki Vincent. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I'd like to start by commending Commissioner Stevens for his courage in seeking to shine a light on sex discrimination, sexual harassment and predatory behaviour in SAPOL. By inviting the Equal Opportunity Commission to undertake an independent review, Commissioner Stevens has shown not only courage, but a genuine commitment to tackling these issues. For those who turn to SAPOL to protect them, or who look to SAPOL to begin a career in law enforcement, confidence in our police force is essential. This review is the culmination of six months' work by my team, hearing from roughly 2,000 current and former staff. My team travelled across the state to speak confidentially with people working in regional areas as well as those working in senior management positions within SAPOL. The experiences of many of those who spoke out are a salient reminder of the insidious effect that discriminatory and harassment behaviours can have on individuals, their colleagues and the broader community. Sadly, Sex, sex discrimination and sexual harassment are prevalent in the community and in many workplaces across the nation. They come at a high cost. Re research has shown that impacts include increased emotional and mental and financial stress, anxiety and depression, loss of confidence, career stalling or regression and a loss of trust in the organisation. Flow-on effects for organisations include productivity loss, higher employee turnover, reduced morale and absenteeism, along with possible legal costs and loss of reputation. 
The, co the cost to the Australian economy is estimated at $25 billion per year. So what did we find in SAPOL? Sex discrimination and sexual harassment of women and anyone else who doesn't fit the white macho male stereotype is commonplace, including among supervisors and managers. Only 32% of the total SAPOL workforce is female, with women significantly overrepresented in lower level administrative roles. 45% of those who responded to our survey reported that they had experienced some form of sex discrimination. Those more likely to be experiencing this were female, identified as gay, lesbian or bisexual, and those working in the metropolitan region rather than a regional area. There were many examples of sex discrimination from women who became pregnant or who were returning from maternity leave. SAPOL was often referred to as a boys' club and women reported being regularly put down in relation to their gender. We also found women were offered less training, development and promotional opportunities than men. In addition, access to flexible work, a hallmark of contemporary, responsive and professional workplaces, is limited in SAPOL. The survey responses were unequivocal when it came to the difficulties of accessing flexible work. While 30% said they wanted it, only 8% actually have it. 61% said it was very difficult to work part-time and have a career in SAPOL, and 71% said that flexible work practices are applied inconsistently. While all employees should be able to access flex flexible work arrangements and there's growing demand from male parents and those transitioning to retirement, the lack of access impacts women more because they're currently more likely to be carers. One of the most insidious effects of sex discrimination is that it lays the ground for other damaging behaviours such as sexual harassment. In terms of sexual harassment, the most common behaviours experienced in SAPOL were suggestive comments and lewd jokes, intrusive questions about a person's private life or comments on their physical appearance, and unwelcome touching, hugging or cornering. At the most serious end, a small number indicated that they had experienced sexual assault. So while the prevalence of sexual harassment in SAPOL was found to be similar to that in the general workforce population over the last five years, 21% for females and 8% for males, we expect better from our police force. Particularly since the amount of predatory behaviour, that's where sexual harassment is perpetrated by someone in authority or influence over the victim, was over 20% higher. We found chronic underreporting of sex discrimination and sex, sexual harassment in SAPOL. 21% of those who reported they'd experienced discrimination and 12% of those who'd experienced sexual harassment had made a complaint. Respondents said they didn't report because the complaint system is slow, lacking in transparency and confidentiality and ineffective. There is a culture of stigmatisation and victimisation of those who do complain and there are a lack of significant consequences for perpetrators. To help SAPOL change this situation, the Equal Opportunity Commission has made 38 recommendations for action. These include develop, developing a gender equality strategy that is in, integrated throughout SAPOL's overall business strategy with appropriate governance and reporting mechanisms and key performance indicators for all leaders and managers. Overhauling the complaints and dispute resolution systems and processes. Undertaking training for all staff on sexual harassment, sex discrimination, unconscious bias and bystander responsibilities setting targets for women at promotion, training and development pathways in line with the proportion of women in the organisation, reviewing all standards and promotional requirements for unconscious bias and embracing flexible work, normalising this across all roles for all staff. These recommendations aim to develop a culture of gender equality where sex discrimination and sexual harassment are not tolerated and where everyone in the workplace is treated with respect. Challenging and addressing, in some cases, deep-seated beliefs that lead to sex discrimination and sexual harassment will not be easy. 
but there is a lot of goodwill. There are so many SAPOL staff who love their jobs, they just want to be treated respectfully by their colleagues. This change will call for strong leadership, experimenting with new ways of doing things, frequent communication and persistence over time. I want to make it clear that becoming a gender equitable organisation doesn't mean that the concept of merit goes out the window. But when what counts as merit in male-dominated workplaces goes unexamined, we invariably get discrimination. This is because in such environments there are deeply held beliefs and, and norms about who is suitable for leadership that are likely to be a problem for women and others that don't fit the stereotypes. The changes that the Equal Opportunity Commission has recommended won't just benefit women in SAPOL. All employees and the general public can be, be expected to benefit from a more representative, agile, innovative and contemporary police force. I wish you well, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, the person that we've selected um, has done extensive work within the human resources space and has been uh, a key part of um, supporting the independent review, uh, providing access to staff um, information, statistics, and it's my view that this person is well equipped to move forward in this space. We've also seen um, other implementations of this type um, with a male lead. There are, there's another part to it as well, and that is that um, I'm a firm advocate for men taking responsibility for their part of the mess, so to speak. So I think this is an important message that we send as well, that um, this is not a women's issue that women must fix. This is an organisational issue and we've chosen a key person who can do that. Has any disciplinary action been taken specifically as a result of some of the things that have been raised um, by people who took part in this survey? No disciplinary action has uh, commenced at this stage. Uh, all of the participants in the independent review have provided their information through uh, confidential surveys or interviews. So we have not been provided details of anybody who may have committed any breaches of discipline um, or committed any offences against any act. So in the event that anybody seeks to come forward uh, and provide us that information, we'll then act on that information accordingly and we are intending to establish a task force uh, of investigators to you know, actively investigate those allegations should they be made to us. Do you think as a result of that task force you will see a spate of disciplinary action to respond? Well, it's, it's an unknown quantity. Um, my advice is that in many instances people simply want to have their story listened to. They don't necessarily want to make a formal complaint and in the absence of the identity of a complainant then there's very little we can do. But we are mindful of the fact that there is a potential for people to come forward and we'll respond accordingly. Um, I, I have to be honest and say that I was I was shocked by the extent of the, uh, the the incidents that were provided to us in the report. It was my expectation that we would see some evidence of uh, discrimination and harassment, um, but I was very disappointed in terms of the the significant predatory behaviour that we've uh, been been advised of. Um, but it, it, I think it does set a clear pathway for us now in terms of. Um, holding people to account for their behaviour and uh, supporting people who come forward to report instances of uh, predatory behaviour, discrimination and harassment. Do your leadership positions need a shake-up? Is that something you'll, you'll look at again, given the high rate of predatory behaviour? Well, the, uh, the leadership within the organisation has a significant role to play in going forward and I think first in that step is to acknowledge that we are a part of the organisation and we've all had a part in terms of how the organisation has been managed and the culture that we currently um, have within the organisation. And it's a, it's a time for uh, our managers to reflect on uh, how they've come through the organisation, the culture they've been a part of, and how they can now make positive steps to change that culture. Um, as uh, the, the Equal Opportunity Commissioner indicated, uh, we'll be providing extensive training and we'll be asking our people to reflect on their own careers and um, how they can now be a part of uh, enhancing the culture that. Uh, we are proud of, but we certainly have this element that we need to address because this is not something we are proud of. As Commissioner, is there anything publicly that you would like to say to the people that have, I guess, had the courage to, while it is confidentially, mm. express what they've been experiencing over the last five years and, and even longer? Well, firstly, um, I'm grateful 
to the people who have come forward and completed the survey and those people who have come forward and provided information in face-to-face -face interviews um, or made written responses to the Equal Opportunity Commission. I'm ashamed that people within this organisation have had to experience that and I'm disappointed that the behaviours and those significant predatory behaviours that you've been advised of have occurred and been committed by people who are South Australia Police employees. I unreservedly apologise to those people who have been victims of this type of behaviour and I'm giving my personal commitment to ensuring that we do what we can to change the culture and to provide them the mechanisms to know that they can report these types of uh, events with confidence, with confidentiality if that's what they choose, but to know that their, their reports will be taken seriously and acted upon and that there will be appropriate consequences for people who breach legislation or a disciplinary framework. Has no action been taken against I guess, perpetrators over the last five years of the people detailed? I, I missed the start of your question. Has no action been taken? Well, I think the report indicates that regardless of what decisions have been made by the people dealing with the disciplinary matters, the perception, rightly or wrongly, by those people who have been victims of this type of behaviour do not consider those actions to be appropriate. And I think that's a key message, one we have to take on board, and it needs to be reflected in how we go forward in terms of the, the sanctions we apply against people who breach legislation. Um, it's also important to note, and this is why we're setting up the uh, restorative engagement process, is that some people simply want to tell their story and to be believed and to be regarded as a truthful person and I'm committed to that as well. Not everybody necessarily wants action to be taken but they want an opportunity to tell their story and it's important we hear those stories because it helps us change our culture for the better. How confident are you that you can change this culture I suppose from within um, and, and achieve that yourselves? Well I suppose the only thing I can be confident about is my resolve to work through these recommendations. I'm hopeful that the recommendations will provide us a foundation to make the changes that need to occur, but it will be um, on the shoulders of every South Australia Police employee to understand the pathway we're on, and this will not be an overnight fix. This will be something that will take, uh, as the Commissioner indicated, resilience and consistent effort over a long period of time, and I'm committed to that change process. Well, any how long do you think that will take, though, that change process? Well, I suppose that's where we need to be measured, is how quickly we can make positive change. 38 recommendations uh, with varying degrees of complexity in terms of implementation will be the, 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 the work of the new team that are being put together to work through those recommendations and I'm hopeful that we can make immediate changes in some of those priority areas as quickly as possible. Um, but I think we should be measured on how well we perform against uh, the benchmarks that have been indicated we should adopt so we can measure our uh, culture as we go forward in the future. I can't put a time frame on it, but I am committed to making sure that the change is uh, appropriate and timely. The report included a number of case studies where people have made complaints and felt like they either been disregarded or made out to be a liar or not mm. believed. Will those complaints be revisited in your mind? Well, I think that's... Uh, Part of that is the, the wishes of the people involved. Firstly, whether they want to come forward and um, provide those stories to us directly uh, through the safe space process, and then making an assessment of what legislative options we have at our disposal, uh, acknowledging that in some circumstances where a matter has been finalised, we might be legislatively bound or inhibited in terms of reinvestigating, but we'll certainly want to hear those stories and see what we can do. And can you give a guarantee to those people who have come forward in the past that this new process will be different and they will be listened to? I can give a guarantee that we are going to change our processes so people will be listened to, they will be believed, and their information will be acted upon in accordance with their wishes. Commissioner, what's your message, I guess, to the, the boys' club and, I guess, those people that have been able to get away with these actions? Well, I suppose we, uh, we need to reflect on the history of the organisation and like anything, uh, like any organisation, we've had a culture which has changed over time and behaviours and practices which may have been acceptable in another era are no longer acceptable now and the people who work within the organisation, man or woman, need to accept that this is the environment we're working in and they need to comply with these obligations. Do you consider yourself a member of the Boys Club? It's very difficult, I suppose, to personally reflect. Um, I've been a member of the South Australia Police for 35 years, so I'm not standing here telling you that I haven't been a part of um, behaviours that at some point in time uh, might have been acceptable, but on reflection now clearly don't meet today's standard. Um, it's on each person's uh, own shoulders, I think, to reflect on how they've conducted themselves within the organisation and uh, at least commit to uh, working with us to improve the workplace for all employees. You said something about current staff, sorry. 
this, is this something that current staff have had much of a chance to respond to yet? How have uh, how's the, the boys' club, I guess, reacted to these findings so far? We've provided some preliminary information to our workforce um, regarding this particular review. Um, the, the, the main thrust at this point in time has been for those people who have been providing information through surveys and interviews to give their stories. This is a, a, a significant milestone in this process where today we are releasing the report. It is being made available to all South Australia Police employees. They're, be given, they're given a, um, a, a template and a, or a leaflet which summarises the key findings. And I acknowledge that not every single person in SAFOL is going to read the entire report, but they will be provided directly specific information that outlines the behaviours we've identified and the actions we are committed to taking to improve the workplace. You said you were shocked by the report. Would you say it's um, maybe not some of the things that are happening but how prevalent it is? What, what is it that... I think it's, as as it's probably both. Um, when you hear about um, sexual assault being committed within the workplace, um, I defy anyone to say they're not shocked by that. Um, those who are not shocked need to reflect on what they've done to prevent those sorts of events and to support people who um, have been the victim of that sort of behaviour. Uh, I'm also concerned, obviously, that uh, so many people have come forward, and whilst it's acknowledged that there are some positive stories in the feedback interviews, uh, my concern is for the people who have experienced um, victimisation in these areas, and uh, the fact that so many people have provided this information is the catalyst for change. How concerned are you and what changes have we made in relation to um, some of the allegations in the report of the way victims were treated um, by members of the police force or even um, witnesses as well, rated on their attractiveness or um, at the appropriate sort of behaviour display towards them? It's not a behaviour that I'm prepared to tolerate. Um, I'm committed to changing uh, the way we interact, not just internally, but with uh, the broader community as well. Um, South Australia Police enjoys a, a very strong reputation within the community and my goal is to maintain that reputation and to enhance it and I think this is one of those steps that we need to take. Commissioner, at the moment you're obviously going after those 313 new officers as part of that. You mm. want to be, be attract women and also young women as part of that. What can you sort of say to them who see this and is it still a promising path for those you know, young women out there? Well, as the Equal Opportunity Commissioner suggested, um, the prevalence of this type of behaviour within SAPOL is consistent with what we see in other industries, uh, not just in South Australia, but um, nationally and internationally. So we are no different. Um, I still consider us to be an employer of choice. And evidence of that is the fact that we have done this work. Uh, we've identified the need to check what our organisation looks like. And I can say now, I have a clear picture of the work that needs to be done. And I don't think there are many other industries in South Australia that can say the same thing. Are you able to say at the moment if there's been any um, improvement with the 50-50 target that you said that well, uh, we've been committed to the 50-50 target and that's a, a continuing commitment and it's a part of our um, program to meet the additional 313 recruits program. So um, it's acknowledged that the 50-50 uh, the parity strategy um, will be slow in delivering true equity within the organisation, but I consider it to be a, a legitimate and uh, very transparent step forward in the right direction. Is there any I can say, I can say uh, with absolute um, uh, assurance that we have had a significant uptake in um, calls for applications and formal applications being lodged by female uh, applicants and I'm very pleased about that. It's in the order of about 45% uh, I think at the moment uh, constitutes female applications which is um, significantly higher than what it has been for a very long time and I put this down to the, the work that we've been doing in relation to recruiting and marketing but I think uh, it's also about the fact that I, I think we are seen as an employer of choice and I'm hopeful that our commitment to examining what our culture looks like and making a commitment to ensuring it's a safe place for everybody uh, adds to that um, reputation. Are you concerned about how the general public might react to this report? It doesn't paint this particular aspect of the force in a very good light. Of course I'm concerned about that. Uh, as I said, we enjoy a very strong reputation within the community. My resolve is to maintain that reputation and I want to give an assurance that uh, we are committed to the highest level of service delivery to the community of South Australia. I think this goes to ensuring that and that is that we are making sure that our officers are treated appropriately at work and uh, are clearly uh, educated in terms of what is appropriate behaviour, not just in the workplace but within the community. Final questions please. Are you able to ask me? Sure. sure. Um, in your experience,
next meeting to use a hand down, do you feel it appropriate for a male to be heading the task force to implement this change? I don't think there's one silver bullet solution to who should actually um, implement the change. I think, um, as Commissioner Stevens said, um, uh, somebody with such a long experience in SAPOL uh, who uh, has been part of the problem is actually in quite a good position to create the change, provided they're committed and understand and are transformed by what they've seen uh, in our report, I think. And we'll be monitoring uh, progress over over the next three years about what's occurring and auditing what's occurring in SAPOL. How will you be monitoring it? Um, we'll be taking measures, um, keep looking at the key performance indicators and providing a report back on a regular basis about how it's all going and what we're seeing and the impacts of uh, implementation of our recommendations. How did you, how did you sort of assess um, the way employees responded to this? Did you, were you overly happy with the response, the amount of people who took it seriously and did yeah. get back to you? Yeah. Um, we were pretty amazed by the number of responses that we got. We were aiming for about 30 per cent, um, but it was quite um, a big response in a short space of time. So we were very pleased that we had a very representative sample uh, from the population of SAPOL workers. When did SAPOL get your review? Um, the, the review came today. It's been uh, in the process of we've had drafts and things like that coming back and forth for a while, so they haven't been completely shocked by today's uh, report. But um, their, their commitment was to release it when they received it. Some of the interviews were done face to face, and a lot were online. Yeah. What did that provide you, I guess, actually getting to hear from some people face to face? And how tough was it for some people to talk about yeah. their experiences? I think it was tough for both the people um, involved talking about their experiences. It was also tough for our team hearing some of those stories. Um, I think the um, what we were surprised about, though, in the, the um, individual interviews were fantastic opportunity to really sort of dig deep into the stories and, and, and um, spend some time with people. What we're, we were amazed about was the, the amount of free tech Text, uh, we got in the surveys as well. People just wanted to tell the, st the story. So we had reams and reams and reams of qualitative data that we weren't anticipating. Um, it does show the passion um, that people feel for you know, doing something about this issue in SAPOL. One of the things you raise in the report is just amongst SAPOL how I guess, unhappy they were with the resolution compared to, I guess, other workforces. What do you put that down to? Um, well, I think uh, Commissioner Stevens has said uh, the, the complaint uh, processes within SAPOL are slow, um, they're not transparent, they're, it's not seen that, that the outcomes are um, appropriate for perpetrators um, and people feel um, victimised all over again, um, not just by the complaint processes but by it being um, not confidential and other people finding out and, and their workmates victimising them. Um, so I think that's, the, that's one of the main uh, recommendations that we've made and one of the things we'd like to see happen very quickly in SAPOL is that change to those systems. You guys have done this before. How realistically, I guess, how long can you sort of expect or hope to see a significant change in, in culture and attitudes? I think um, with culture change, it is long term. I think if our, imp our recommendations are implemented in full, we will see some significant change within the next three years. We'll probably see some immediate change in some of the indicators, um, and then we'll see some significant change over the next three years. It will then require the leadership to continue that. Uh, it won't be sustainable because uh, 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 after three years, because if leadership changes and so forth, that can really impact it. I would expect if it's continued, uh, it, it sets us on, up on a course for success over the next decade or so. Final questions, please. Commissioner, what, sure. um, what now? What's the first step? When, when we leave, we see, will we see immediate change? Well, I, I think I can say with certainty that you will see immediate change. Or you might not see it uh, outwardly, but people within the organisation will see change straight away. Um, having allocated an, uh, a, a, an assistant commissioner to drive this uh, implementation means that we'll be identifying those recommendations that need to be acted on with a priority and we will start the act uh, in, that, in that space. We're also, as I mentioned, uh, creating the safe space so people who want to come forward and talk to us can do so uh, with confidence and uh, the restorative engagement process will start immediately as well. So um, you know, we're, we're prepared to listen to these stories and, and to truly understand what people have experienced so we can acknowledge that and 
take that big step forward in the right direction. So um, we have some work to do, but uh, the, the organisation has shown that it's capable of adapting, and this, is, uh, this can only be seen as a positive in, in terms of how we move forward from here. Will leadership changes be part of it, I guess? You know, obviously people have said they're feeling like the current leaders haven't heard what they're saying. I know you've talked about change of attitude. Do they need to see a different face? I, no, I, I think what they need to see is a change in uh, an approach by leadership, um, an acknowledgement of our past and a commitment to moving forward with uh, the implementation of these recommendations and appreciating uh, the importance that leadership plays. So I don't, at this point, subject to any further information coming forward, have any plans to change leadership. But I do have a, a, a very strong expectation of the leadership team within the organisation to embrace um, the contents of this report, uh, to acknowledge and to reflect on uh, how we move forward constructively and to do it as a team. Will former employees have an opportunity to take part in the restorative engagement program or is there any existing? No, no, it's, it's, a, it's a, an offer that will be made to anybody who wants to come forward to talk to us. That's, uh, we're certainly not looking to exclude anybody. Um, those stories are relevant and we want to hear them. It may be early days, but if someone comes forward to one of these safe spaces, places to um, report criminal activity, hmm. who will then investigate uh, as, as has been indicated, um, we will set up a dedicated task force um, to manage uh, formal complaints of criminal behaviour. Now, if, if it is the case that we don't have a, a significant number, it will be that we'll allocate dedicated resources to work with the team that are managing the implementation to ensure that there is a degree of independence seen by the workforce uh, to provide that confidence that they should rightly expect as that investigation process goes forward. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.